Hi, my name is Brett Parker. I'm the executive director here at the New York City Bar, and I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome you to this event, um, the high-level side event to the UN 62nd Commission on the Status of Women. Um, you know, this, this program has been a long time in the making, and we're so grateful um, not only that you're here, but that the speakers are here, um, and that um, we have a number of people who help put this event together. Um, you know, we are the New York City Bar Association, but we, we really do think of ourselves as much broader than New York City. And, um, there, you know, there's nothing more important for lawyers these days than the rule of law, uh, protecting the rule of law, strengthening the rule of law, and defending us against attacks on the rule of law. So um, this program uh, relating to the, the, the Commission on the Status of Women is very near and dear to the association's heart, and we're very pleased to be hosting it tonight. Um, I want to uh, thank a couple of our event partners, the International Law Development Organization, UN Women, Advocates for International Development, the Landessa Rural Development Institute, and HellPage International. Um, I also want to uh, thank the sponsors of our B VIP reception, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, as well as Hoffman and Kessler LLP. And finally, afterwards, there's a general reception. I want to thank Virginia and Ann Binder LLP for sponsoring that and King and Spaulding's uh, Women's Affinity Group for, for being supportive of this event because we really can't do these events without support. So um, I'm, I'm the least, literally the least knowledgeable person in the room on this topic, so um, I'm going to get out of the way. Um, I want to introduce um, Michael Cooper, who's the chair of our UN committee. He's also involved with the University of Oxford North America development team, and he and the UN committee um, along with many others, we're really responsible for pulling this event together. So again, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Michael. Oops. Well, uh, thank you, Brett. This button doesn't seem to be working. Oh, there we go. Um, I, uh, my name's Michael Cooper, and I chair the UN committee here. Uh, we got a late start, so I'm going to try to dispose of my responsibilities fairly quickly. I have a few people as well that I need to thank. First of all would be Brett Parker, our executive director, and his entire team that's helped us put this uh, event together. I'd also like to thank the members of our um, UN committee. There are many of them. I realized as I was going over the list that most of them have names that centuries ago, Eastern European names that were sort of adopted in uh, with the idea in mind of embarrassing me this evening um, when I try to pronounce them, but um, Daria uh, Golubkova, uh, Milana Dostanic, uh, Amy Hoser, that's an easy one, Cynthia Rawlings, Maria Vanikostis, Kyla, uh, Kayla Green, Anna Wol Wolancha. Right, Anna? Thank you so much. Um, and there's another person that I'll introduce to you later, but there were many people on our UN committee that came together to, to pull this event together, and I want to thank them uh, from the bottom of my heart for all the work that they did. And likewise, I'd like to thank my peers who chair other committees, especially in our international cluster, who are co-sponsors of this event, in particular the Human Rights Committee here at the City Bar um, that helped us with sponsoring the, um, the live streaming and the video this evening. So we're really quite grateful to them. So the other thing that I would like to do very quickly here before I introduce my good friend Phil Kessler is just give you a sort of a Sustainable Development Goals 101, if I may. Because not, not everyone in the audience knows about this, I'm sure, but uh, just to orient us a bit to this panel. So in 2000, the United Nations adopted something called the Millennium Development Goals. There were eight goals, and they weren't so much adopted as they were sort of set forth by the Secretary General. And that a paradigm of adopting some global goals proved to be very effective. It gave people a sort of a narrative around which they could organize and um, inspire people. And in fact, at the end of the day, we actually made some pretty good progress on some of those goals. And the goals were set to expire in 2015. And the lessons learned from that were that they were effective enough that we thought it was worth re-upping for another 15 years. So prior to the expiration, the UN started all this work of thinking, well, what do we do next? You know, what, what lessons have we learned and how, how can we move forward? So one of the things they did is instead of sort of setting forth all these goals, they had this huge consultative process where they went out to, uh, there was something called the My World Survey, where they did online surveys, but also literally went around the world to try and ask people, what are the most important things to you when it comes to sustainable development? You know, volunteers hiked into villages that were difficult to reach several hours 
into the jungle or whatever to sit down and ask people what was important to them. So there was this sort of consultative process with the people of our planet and also with the nation states and the countries and NGOs and others that got involved in the consultative process. So at the end of the day, we came up with these things called the Sustainable Development Goals. And the idea is that they should last for 15 years, from 2015 to 2030. So they're also called the 2030 Agenda, if you will. And I'd just like to take one quick moment to draw some distinctions, if I may, between the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and the SDGs, on the other hand. And to my mind, there's sort of five uh, kind of key distinctions. So one I would label as consultative, you know, the idea that um, there was broad agreement on these particular goals, where in the past they were sort of set forward as a, a kind of a... Um, you know, a PR sort of organizing framework from the Secretary General. So in this case, there was really true consultative process. So what happens when you ask a lot of people what their opinions are, you get a lot of opinions. So the second thing about the goals is that they're much more comprehensive. Instead of only eight goals, there are actually 17 goals. And there are 169 different targets. So it's a bit, uh, forgive the religious analogy, but it's a bit like a Christmas tree. Every kind of ornament's hanging on it. Um, so is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, I think we'll learn more about that tonight. The third thing I would say is a real distinguisher is that the Millennium Goals were focused on only low-income countries, or what we might call developing countries, whereas the Sustainable Development Goals are universal. They apply to all countries, including high-income, so-called developed countries as well. So that's, that's an important distinguisher. I think this, the fourth thing I would mention is that they're very progressive goals and that they uh, if you think about it, if you have a goal of raising literacy, for instance, and you want to move it from, you know, 40% literacy to 60% literacy, what's the easiest way to do that? The easiest way is to find that 20% of people who it's easiest to get literate, right, who are very close to that target. So you can say, wow, we, we moved the needle because we went to the easiest place, the lowest, uh, you know, the hanging fruit, and we, you know, we met our target. So one of the concepts behind the Sustainable Development Goals is leave no one behind. So, you know, start with the least of these, if you will, the people that are most impoverished, most vulnerable, focus on them first, and if we can raise them up, the others will come along with them. So that's really a, an important distinguisher. And the final thing I would say that distinguishes them, and it, I couldn't find a better word, but I think it's that they're more empowering. And why is that? Um, on one hand, I think because the sustainable goals are so specific. So for instance, goal 16 is sort of our goal for attorneys, right? It's about rule of law and access to justice and peaceful societies and all those sorts of things. But there are very specific targets under it. So for instance, you know, goal 16.9 is that by 2030, we would provide legal identity for all people, including birth registration. So if you're a person who's interested in making a contribution, you can think, well, that's important to have a legal identity. I can't sue people. I can't sign a contract. I, you know, I can't do the, all these things. I can't buy property unless I have an identity. In order to have an identity, I need to prove that I was born. So that's something that I could work on. I could work on birth registration throughout the world. So it's very specific ideas, but at the same <clears> time, it, it, there's been a lot of work to talk about how all of these targets are interrelated. And in closing out this part of my short, I hope, presentation, you know, one of the things I'd like to say that our committee struggled with when we were thinking about this event is, do we focus only on goal 16 for its intrinsic value? There is intrinsic value in access to justice and rule of law and all those things. Or do we focus on the extent to which goal 16 helps us to realize all of the other goals and targets across the spectrum? And we made the decision with the help of my friend Catherine Ball, whom I'll introduce as well soon, that we should take the second approach and think about how Goal 16 and rule of law affects the entire agenda. And so we have several examples of that up here tonight. I'm really looking forward to hearing those. So that's SDGs 101. I hope that's helpful to everyone. I'd like to briefly introduce my good friend, um, Philip Kessler, who uh, has an amazing career as a litigator, um, working on a lot of important cases that I won't mention here, but civil rights and other things, um, and has recently started a new law firm here in the city, Hoffman and Kessler, and we're grateful to them for helping to support our event this evening. And uh, is here, though, tonight in his capacity as a representative of the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law in the UK, which has been a very close partner to City Bar over the past couple of years, doing these events and trying to raise awareness around um, the SDG. So I'll ask Phil to come up and say a few words about the Bingham Center, if he would. And then afterwards, I'll um, introduce one more colleague and then turn the floor over. Thank you.
hope I don't have to move this. Um, thanks very much, Michael. Much appreciated. Uh, we want to thank the City Bar for giving the Bingham Center the opportunity to support this truly important program tonight. Uh, the Bingham Center is also extremely grateful to tonight's distinguished speakers. You've got some great people that you're going to hear from. To those who have put the program together, I've talked to Catherine Ball quite a lot since last Friday when she called me. I still haven't met her. I have a feeling that may be you. It is. <laughs> Uh, and also to those who worked on the 62nd Commission's priority theme, a very important theme that brings all of us together tonight. Um, a bit of history about the Bingham Center, because it's not well known, to say the very least, in the United States, but we aim to change that. It was founded in 2010 in London in honor of the late Tom Bingham. Lord Bingham was perhaps uh, Britain's greatest jurist and legal mind uh, in the modern era. His acclaimed book, The Rule of Law, which I would encourage all of you to read if you have rule of law interests, and since you're here, I'll bet you do, uh, defined the rule of law because it's often misused, misunderstood, and sometimes willfully distorted. And he also explained very persuasively its vital importance to what he called, quote, good government, peace at home, and in the world at large. The Bingham Center is committed to promoting a clear understanding globally, globally, of the rule of law and to using practical means to enable the world to realize its benefits. This includes assisting countries in adopting and implementing rule of law-based systems. Uh, the Bingham Center aspires to help all people everywhere enjoy a better life through a more stable and secure world. Our rule of law based mission is driven by our conviction that the rule of law, when it's fairly defined, when it's consistently recognized, and when it's consistently applied, is the essential precondition for sustainable development. I want to give you just a very quick high level sense of some of the things that we've actually done. To give you a, a, a truly representative list would take the whole evening. We've assisted in developing uh, we have assisted both developing or transitioning societies in adopting effective rule of law systems, and that includes things like creating constitutions, training judges in judicial independence, impartiality, and consistency. We've actively encouraged uh, the rule of law to be featured prominently in the post-2015 development agenda. We urged the rule of law's inclusion in the SDGs that Michael was talking about, uh, that's, that's 16. We are working to establish now that the rule of law embodied in SDG 16 is the foundation for achieving so many of the other SDGs. Some of our work has demonstrated that strong legal frameworks are indispensable to women's empowerment and to the recognition and protection of their fundamental rights. For example, by showing the importance of human rights standards when reforming sexual violence law in Nepal. On May 2nd, just to give you a further sense of the range, we'll hold a conference in London on the role of the private sector in implementing the SDGs. And indeed, the chief of the rule of law unit in the UN Secretary General's office will be one of our key speakers. To conclude very quickly, we believe that there can be no meaningful empowerment of rural women or really of any other group without the rule of law centered frameworks and institutional machinery to enable fundamental human rights and corresponding legal rights to be recognized and enforced. Without that, we have nothing. We place great importance, therefore, on the priority theme that brings us together tonight. It lies squarely within the Bingham Center's strategic priorities, particularly that of sustainable development and the rule of law and the relationship between those things. So I thank you very much for the opportunity that you've given us to support this worthy program, and I hope you enjoy the evening and are inspired by it. Thank you. If you'll 
bear with me, I'd just like to take one more moment to introduce you to Catherine Ball, who is a member of our committee and the person responsible for organizing the event tonight. And I really do owe her a special debt of gratitude. I don't know of too many people who are more knowledgeable about the politics and the procedure of the United Nations. And so I've leaned on her many times as chair of the UN Committee for her advice and good counsel. And I have to say she's done real uh, yeoman's work or yo person's work, if you will, in putting this um, event together. And I have the 2.30 a.m. text messages from her to prove that. Um, she's um, uh, helped go through a number of different challenges to manage all of this. A great personal sacrifice, I have to say. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to her. She's been a legal advisor to a number of missions and consultant, uh, legal consultant to a number of UN missions, um, highly knowledgeable. And uh, I have to say that this is the magic moment in the program that you've all been looking forward to where the men sit up and sh sit down and shut up and turn the floor over to the women who are actually doing the work, the amazing women on this panel. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to Michael Cooper, our chair, and I concur that uh, we have a phenomenal panel of incredible competence and expertise uh, before us tonight. Uh, so rather than taking time myself uh, after thanking uh, our chair and, of course, Executive Director Brett Parker and the Association for hosting this first high-level side event, I'd like to skip very quickly to our program uh, and introduce our participants to you tonight. As you know, we are undertaking the very exciting challenge of exploring the role of legal frameworks, frameworks of the law, in advancing development objectives under Agenda 2030. Tonight we're taking that focus uh, to rural women and examining case studies uh, in which uh, uh, lawyers and, and entities that, that do work around legal themes have tried to use the law and legal frameworks to advance the status of rural women. And uh, we will examine that uh, uh, in the form of two keynotes. Uh, the first keynote is from uh, the Director General of the IDLO, Dr. Irene Khan, a, a personal hero of mine who almost needs no introduction. Uh, she's the first female Director General of the IDLO. Before that, she was the Secretary General of Amnesty International from 2001 to 2009. Prior to that, she worked for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for many years, and her book, The Unheard Truth, Poverty and Human Rights, uh, was a work which actually personally inspired me to pursue the field of international human rights, so it's my great pleasure to have her on my left tonight. The second keynote will be delivered by a phenomenal woman, Yasmin Batlawala. Uh, she's the chief executive officer of an NGO that is absolutely leading in the field of partnerships between lawyers and law firms and development entities in achieving legal frameworks uh, that can be used to advance development objectives. And her entity will be participating in a very exciting launch later this year at the United Nations of a publication uh, that is leading in this field that was achieved in partnership with 10 law firms entitled Legal Guide to the Sustainable Development Goals. This is very exciting and we're very pleased to hear her talk about partnerships. Uh, after these two keynotes, uh, we will have two legal case study presentations. Uh, the first on target 1.4 is by Dr. On my left, Dr. Justine Uvuza. She is the Senior Land Policy Advisor on Gender for Landessa Rural Development Institute. Landessa is, is a very well-established and well-tenured uh, institute operating in the field of land tenure uh, and empowerment. And uh, she will describe several initiatives that are currently ongoing uh, to empower rural women in the, in the field of land tenure. Following that, we will hear from Christine Karen, who uh, practiced for almost 40 years with the law firm of Norton Rose Fulbright Canada, where she retired as a senior partner uh, after being the head of their pro bono division uh, during the time of the project that she will present, where she led four law firms to partner with the development entity HelpAge International on a fascinating uh, legal study to try to prevent uh, rural women from being persecuted for charges of witchcraft in four countries in Africa. She will describe her conclusions about that. Uh, and then finally, we will hear the programmatic perspective from our representative from UN Women, Dr. Beatrice Duncan. Dr. Duncan is the Rule of Law Advisor in Justice and Constitutions and, and will be closing and framing our panelists. Uh, and she, um, she began her career in Ghana and has worked in the programmatic aspect of uh, a number of uh, uh, United Nations agencies, um, most recently UNICEF Ghana, 
uh, and then also the African Center for Gender and Social Development of the Economic Commission for Africa as a gender officer, moving to UNICEF New York, and now she is with UN Women bringing all of this programmatic expertise, and she is leading uh, the movement of UN Women into the area of the interface between gender equality and the law, and I hope that she will talk about uh, some of the ways that UN Women will look to expand into this critical area uh, in the coming year as it, as it realizes uh, the essential nature of the law in advancing gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Uh, following that, uh, with the assistance of our phenomenal moderator, Kim Azzarelli, who is here on my right, we will engage in a moderated dialogue and question and answer, uh, including the opportunity to receive questions and answers from social media platforms. And on that note, I say hello to all of us, all of you who are join joining us via Facebook Live platforms with the IDLO and with the Association of the Bar. Uh, and encourage you to interact with us via Facebook Live as well as via our Twitter Live feeds. We have hashtags in the program. Uh, on, on our moderator, uh, Kim Azzarelli is the co-founder of uh, a group called Seneca Women, which she formed together with Ambassador, Mel Ambassador Melanie Revere, uh, and is the co-author of the book Fast Forward, How Women Can Achieve Power and Purpose, uh, she is a co-founder of the Cornell Center for Women and Justice and a founding partner at Seneca Point Global. Uh, and she also, her, her other hat, her, her very legal hat, is she's an adjunct professor at Cornell Law School. So uh, we have among us an incredibly estimable panel of competent, wonderful, beautiful legal professional, professionals who are women. And I'm, I'm humbled uh, uh, for the knowledge that they're about to share with us. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. Switch works. Good. Not quite the height of Ginsburg, <laughs> but pretty close. <laughs> yes. Um, well, actually, whenever I come to these kinds of uh, legal gatherings, I uh, feel a bit overwhelmed, and uh, so I need to make a confession. Just as you have lapsed Catholics, I'm a lapsed lawyer. I did go to law school, I do have two law degrees, but somewhere along the way in my career, I lost my path from law and went into practice, not legal practice, but real practice on the ground, uh, with refugees, with uh, human rights uh, victims and others, and uh, then into policy work. So what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be, yes, about law, but probably also about the limits of law and uh, how one has to, especially when it comes to women. In fact, the more that I have become engaged in issues of women's rights, the less I have seen the relevance of law. Law, in fact, historically, has oppressed women. It is because of law that women were not allowed to participate in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, or even in their own family lives. So law, and women have an ambiguous relationship still in many parts of the world. Now let me just say a little bit about International Development Law Organization because I will be using examples of our work on the ground. Uh, we are an intergovernmental organization. We are not an NGO. We are made up of governments, governed by governments, but we operate directly on the ground with judicial institutions, legal institutions, governments, and civil society groups to uh, advance the rule of law and access to justice uh, for peace, for development, uh, for human rights purposes. And we work on the ground across all regions of the world, often in some of the most insecure and poorest places on earth, uh, in Somalia, for example, South Sudan, Liberia, Afghanistan. Uh, also increasingly, of course, we also work in countries like Kenya and Mexico. Uh, and many of the people with whom and for whom we work are women, and among them, a uh, good proportion are rural women. Now, I'm very pleased that this evening, uh, we have an opportunity to talk about rural women. Uh, and it's important, now that the majority of the <coughs> world's population is urban, uh, to, to look, to think about these rural women and how they actually 
underpin and support us and make our lives livable. And it's interesting to do that while standing here in the probably in the iconic uh, urban jungle uh, of Manhattan. But of course, we don't think about rural women because they, they don't appear on TV talk shows. Uh, they don't uh, join the Hash Me Too uh, campaign or Time's Up campaign. Uh, but if they could, they would have a lot to say. Um, this, on, on Monday, when the 62nd Commission on the Status of Women opened, uh, the head of UN Women uh, s pointed out in her opening statement that the world eats every day because rural women and girls toil. And that was a quite a strong statement. It basically put into perspective this issue about rural women, that they are actually agents of change. They contribute to the agricultural economy. They play a vital role in preserving natural resources, of land and water, <coughs> water, for example. They facilitate, in many ways, the achievement of the sustainable development goals that were mentioned uh, just now. Uh, according to the World Food or uh, and Agricultural Organization, almost half of the world's agricultural labor force is female. And among, there are some 600 million livestock keepers. Women constitute a large majority. So their role in managing land and water resources is critical. But is their contribution to the gross domestic product fully recognized? Are they at the table when world leaders sit down to talk about agricultural policies or climate change issues or peace and security? Uh, so, this, the, 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 so we have to start by, when we look at law, uh, look at who the law is meant to protect. Because we as lawyers believe that the law protects, empowers, and dispenses justice. But unfortunately, the lived experience of many women, and I would say especially rural women, in the poorest parts of the world, tell a different story of how law is used to inhibit and oppress, how the law ignores and overlooks injustices, and leaves them often with no remedy. Now, of course, rural women and girls suffer often the same injustices and inequalities as other women in their country or in their situation, but they are doubly disadvantaged because of their remote location, because very often they lack education, they have no resources that we in urban societies do. For instance, women farm the land, but they're not allowed by law or custom in many countries to own it. And uh, the statistics, statistics, reliable statistics are difficult to find, but uh, data suggest that on average, women hold about 20% of land titles uh, in the world. Uh, and there are, of course, many other uh, social customs and legal uh, barriers that they confront um, and do not have access to justice. And this is why sustainable Development Goal 16. This is the goal about rule of law, access to justice, inclusive societies, effective institutions, is so important in order to deliver Goal 5, which is about gender equality. The relevance of putting in that framework to help advance women's cause. And I heard, listened with great interest uh, earlier to the presentation about the SDGs. I think the SDGs are also um, distinct for one other reason. For the first time in the development discourse, there was this notion that good governance, rule of law, effective institutions are fundamental to development. Prior to this, prior to SDG 16, that discussion was taking place somewhere else, not in the context of, of development. But finally, there was realization that you needed this framework if you were going to develop, if you were going to um, advance development on a sustainable basis. So I think that, that is absolutely critical. And so we see for the first time an opening up of the issue of gender equality, not in terms of how many girls are going to school or whether women have access to hospitals, but in terms of women's rights of women's ability to claim those rights, about legal empowerment. Uh, so it changes the whole debate of development. 
And this is the empowering, uh, the, uh, I think uh, we heard earlier uh, the notion of empowerment coming into development. And that is, of course, critical for women. Now, earlier today, I made a statement at the Commission um, on the status of women on behalf of IDLO. And the point I made there, that if you talk about rural women, then securing, securing land rights is among the most empowering ways, uh, most effective ways of empowering these women. Because access to land is fundamental for food security. And determines how much food a woman can produce, sell, consume, which affects not only her own situation, but the situation of her family, of her children. So it's absolutely critical. Land is collateral for credit. She can borrow against land. Uh, it also influences other things. We forget, as lawyers, we see land as something on which you, which you register. Uh, there is a title. Um, you own it as an economic asset. But land is also a social asset, especially for women, because with land comes social status. With land comes political influence. We know that historically in many countries, uh, in the 19th century, for example, landowners in, the, in, the, uh, in England, landowners were, were allowed to vote. You couldn't vote if you were not a landowner. So with land comes that status, and that's why land matters so much to women. But for women, uh, land is not a situation of gender equality, on the contrary. And the barriers to women's access to land are multiple. High on the list, however, is laws, often based on religious or customary practices that also govern marriage, divorce, inheritance, and, and so restrict a woman's right uh, to own, acquire, inherit, dispose of land. Um, and as recently, I think my, the data is from 2012, an international survey found that 86 out of 121 countries have discriminatory inher inheritance laws or practices. That's a pretty high number. Uh, in my own country, in Bangladesh, uh, which is a, uh, a former British colony, uh, there, of course, as you know, in many British colonies in Africa and other places, the personal law was not, the, uh, was not framed within the Constitution. The personal law came from your uh, religious, from your, from, your relig from your religion. So as a Muslim, uh, I'm subject to Sharia law in Bangladesh, not to the Constitution, which says everyone is equal, but to Sharia law, which says that I can inherit uh, less than my brother, uh, in fact, even less than my uncle or my nephew. Uh, so, uh, but because I'm educated, I have a well-paid job, I live in the city, I'm a lawyer myself, but I also live in a city where I can access uh, lawyers and courts, the law does not bite me as severely as it does uh, women who are living in the villages in Bangladesh. Uh, so you can see what happens, uh, with the limits of the law for women. And even in countries where there is gender equality in terms of land rights, the implementation challenges are enormous. Uh, usually, and this applies across the board, I think, in many countries uh, for areas of administrative law. It's not only the land commission, but there can be other uh, administrative issues, such as your pension or your identity papers. We saw the reference to identity uh, in, in Goal 16, for example. They are complicated, corrupt, poorly administered. Makes it extremely difficult for women, it makes it hard for everyone, but particularly difficult for women to access those systems and, and get what they need from the law. Uh, many countries don't have compulsory registration of births. Yes, the identity uh, provision will take care of that, but they don't have proper registration of marriages or divorces either. So that really complicates the personal status. And many families actually don't take as much care to register the birth of daughters as they do of sons. So you see from the moment of birth uh, that sort of differentiation that comes into play. What also is true is that even when the laws give women uh, certain rights and those laws are properly implemented uh, when, when claims are made, social pressure 
may force women not to claim their rights. Uh, in India, for example, in 2005, the Indian government introduced the Hindu Succession Act, uh, which t uh, turned, um, repealed the British uh, legislation that had been in place uh, that uh, under which Hindu women were subject to Hindu laws of succession. The government brought in the Hindu Succession Act, giving equal rights to men and women. But many Hindu women actually did not assert their inheritance rights against uh, their um, father's property uh, out of deference to their brothers because it would just create too much of an upheaval in the family situation. And socially, legally, yes, the law gave them the right, but socially, they did not have the support they needed to be able to assert that right and, and live with that assertion. So many women did not claim their rights. Access to justice, of course, is critical for claiming rights, but courts are very often far away, complicated, expensive. We all know that but particularly so for women and rural women. Imagine how much harder it is. Uh, add to all that the fact that they, they can't take time off farms, they have to take care of animals, their children, all sorts of things. So, and, and, and what do you do it for? The risks are too great. The response uh, don't make the legal remedy very often meaningful. Uh, we, we did uh, some, documented some cases in Kenya where women who go to the court to assert their rights um, on land, on domestic violence issues, they are then shunned by their own families, by their communities uh, for being troublesome, for having insulted their menfolk. And we did one research in the Solomon Islands where actually we reviewed dozens of court records and we could not find any women listed as parties. Uh, so we then went and asked in the community, we asked the women, how is it that we never see any women listed in, 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 in the court documents? And the women said that when they tried to enter the court, they were told there's only room for men. There's no room, room for women in here. So they were not even allowed to enter the courthouses. Now, of course, what I'm trying to say here is that whatever you have, the formal laws uh, may be defective, but even where those laws are properly adopted and implemented and enforced, there is an informal justice system that operates in many countries. In some cases, these are called customary systems. In other cases, they really are informal. In my own country, for example, you have an informal dispute resolution mechanism called Shalish, and most people go to it, men as well as women, because they're cheap, they're accessible, they're in the community, um, and they get their justice very fast, the elders sit down together and they decide what to do. But most of these systems, of course, are skewed against women. They do have a gender bias. It's men who are deciding, and there are certain rules that the community will uphold rather than try to seek uh, justice in those situations. Um, and then, of <coughs> course, uh, there are places where land rights, in particular, are very much subject to customary, customary law. And uh, that, of course, creates problems. In Rwanda, for example, legal reform was introduced, strengthened women's statutory land rights just after genocide uh, so that women could have access to land. Uh, but in the villages, they continued to apply customary law. Now, we have a project in Burundi right now where we are looking at land titling exercise there, uh, which has been carried out by another organization under the auspices of the government. And what we found is that, of course, women's rights were informal rights of access to land were not registered. Women were not even aware what the registration process meant. So we did a pilot project where um, we made the women aware of their rights. We encouraged the community leaders to sit down with the women to discuss what would happen if these women lost their rights to land. Who would till the land? It wasn't as though the men were going to go out and work on the farms, no. Um, so if women didn't have access, the land was registered, sold by someone, the, the woman lost her access, who would look after it? And they came to understand, the community came to understand the value of uh, an economic value that women had to have access to land. Women realized that they had rights that they should assert. And we saw actually registration of women's rights going up by about 45% compared to something like 12 or 11% previously. So that, and, and the point I'm making over here is the importance of legal 
uh, empowerment. Uh, the importance of um, legal awareness, legal literacy, of uh, support, paralegal support, for example, legal aid and others that can uh, make a difference. Because gender inequality is fundamentally a patriarchal power game. And you cannot just address it through uh, equality. There is a gender blindness in the concept of equality. You know, we all know that famous line of Anatole France, the rich as well as the poor are forbidden from sleeping under the bridge. Uh, in 19th century Paris, he said that. So equality uh, does not always work and you need a gender lens, a gender perspective. And a gender perspective is, some people might call it uh, a feminist perspective, but I would say a gender perspective because it affects both the roles and responsibilities of men and women. Looking at that uh, requires you to think about the social policies uh, and services that have to underpin uh, legal reform. It means, for example, not just land registration, but simplifying the process, putting it in a language in which women can, can use, and so on. Um, now, one has to be aware of the realities within which women live. And in my business, we go into these countries, we work with local partners, we're working on the ground, the government wants change, everyone is pushing for change, but you, have, you cannot come in, import change. Uh, you have to work with uh, the, uh, what we call a bottom-up and a top-down strategy. The top-down strategy is when we are working with, for example, judiciaries in a number of countries, training them, building up the institutions, uh, developing the capacity of uh, ministries of justice, helping governments to draft constitutions. Bottom-up is actually working with people as to how they will enforce the right, claim the rights, actually benefit uh, from these constitutional changes. And in that process, uh, the gender perspective is extremely important if you really want um, to have women benefit from the changes because it can backfire. Uh, there, have, there was, for example, uh, legislation in India at one point where there was a quota set for women, to, village women, to participate in village councils, a certain number. And what actually happened was, yes, they got a certain number of women, but the council was basically run by these women's husbands. Because these women had, these women had never uh, participated in the process, they didn't know what was happening, they had no idea, and that was it. Now that was something like 15 years or 20 years ago that law was introduced. But over the past 20 years, women have learned. And now you actually see uh, some of these councils, you know, council, women councillors uh, really participating actively into it. I'll give you another example. I sit on the board of, a, of, a, uh, of an NGO in my own country in Bangladesh. And mobile technology. Mobile technology has actually transformed uh, development. And uh, in Kenya, uh, they have a project called M-Pesa, by which you basically use your mobile phone like your credit card. And you can make financial transactions, you load it up and you do everything. Now in Bangladesh, they have started the same thing, Bcash. In Bangladesh now, the transactions are even bigger. Um, I mean, the volume is even bigger than in Kenya. However, when we did an analysis of it, we found that most uh, of Bcash, it's called Bcash, it's called M-Pesa in Kenya, Bcash, um, women were not participating in Bcash. However, women's use of mobile phones is very high in Bangladesh because women love talking and you know, calling their friends and so on, but they're not using it for cash. Um, then we analyzed a little bit and we discovered that the phones are being uploaded. The financial transaction is actually taking place in tea stalls. Across the country, there are hundreds of thousands of tea stalls on the roadside, and that's where you load up your mobile phones. Now, Bangladesh is a conservative Muslim society. Women don't go to tea stalls by the highway. So you, what they usually do is they give the phone to their husbands or their brothers or their sons and ask them to fill the phone up for them to make their conversations. But women don't really want to share their financial situation with their husbands or sons or brothers. They don't really want their husbands to know how much cash they have and how much cash they're spending and what they're doing. So this issue, which is, I think a lot of us would understand that perfectly well, um, which is why the women are not using that system. So now we have to rethink how to do that. And I'm giving you an example from the financial sector, but it could apply as, as well uh, to the legal uh, sector. So if you focus on changing laws without understanding gender politics, 
um, then you actually can end up excluding and marginalizing women. Now, our, our work uh, actually has shown up amazing results of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we have done comparative study, uh, and, and there's been a lot of uh, discussion and study, not just by us, but by others in the sector, as to whether women actually like formal systems or prefer informal systems. And what we've actually found, that women are very canny. They will go where they get the best deal. And so that means if you can give them access, if you can make the changes, uh, if it's an effective, efficient system, then women will use it, uh, whether it's formal or informal. Um, and we've worked and we found, for example, uh, uh, in, in some countries, like in Rwanda, for example, they have a, a, quite an extensive system of informal uh, resolution of disputes. It comes out of the criminal justice system after genocide, which was totally overwhelmed by the number of genocidaires that they had. So they created a very rough and ready system of justice, community justice called Gachacha, and that was condemned by the human rights movement, criticized heavily. They have, of course, learned over the years from that experience, and they've now set up a community mediation system. But they have put in a rule saying half the mediators have to be women. And by forcing, it was an informal system, but they forced that provision, as a result of which you are getting some very interesting decisions with a gender perspective on that. So things uh, can change and do change. Uh, so that's hopeful. Now, we talked about equality that we are all equal in the eyes of the law, equally protected by law, equally accountable to it. That's a core principle. It obviously needs to be interpreted, applied, and understood in a gender-specific way for women. But I think there's a whole lot of change coming forward. There are very, very interesting ways in which communities are working and mobilizing. And I want to um, end here by giving you an example of what I saw in Uganda um, a, a year ago, I was there um, to look into uh, the way in which, in Uganda, um, internet, digital access, um, mobile technology was being used to promote access to justice. And there were fascinating work that young lawyers were doing uh, using um, platforms to provide legal advice to people living in distant, remote, rural areas, the, the volume of cases that they could handle uh, through, through, this, uh, through a laptop that you could physically never ever do it, certainly at not at the cost at which they were doing it. And now they told me about an amazing case in uh, uh, Uganda of a woman, a widow, who uh, her husband passed away and she was trying to assert her right to her husband's land in the village and uh, her brother-in-law didn't agree with her, so he basically took a machete and he chopped her hand off, her arm off. Now, a lot of vi villagers were there and they saw it happen, but when the police came to uh, inquire into it, there were no witnesses. Uh, and so she tried uh, very hard and the state was on her side. They wanted to prosecute the case, but they had great difficulties because witnesses were not available or they turned up in court and the story suddenly changed and so on. So what this young group of lawyers did is they went into court with Facebook Live and they showed the court hearing with this woman, uh, with the witness, and it was all on Facebook Live. And immediately there was a huge uproar all over the country. It became the best known case. Everyone started mobilizing. They said, what is happening in our villages? How is the justice system working? Uh, why can't we deliver justice to a woman? who's obviously someone's chopped her arm off. This is a great, great injustice. What's, what's happening here? And of course, that case was then very rapidly resolved. So you see, when you bring technology, you bring social situations, you bring women, you bring a lot of things together, then you get change. Therefore, when we're talking about law and legal frameworks and, and so on, we need to recognize that law is one element in a much, much bigger firmament when it comes to women's rights and gender equality. Thank you. A very good evening to you all. Does that need to come up? It's with um, pleasure that I 
join you here today. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to share with you some of the work that we are doing and to show you how law and lawyers can have a significant impact in the improvement of the lives of women the world over. But before I do that, I'd like to just say a big thank you to Catherine Ball for not only having invited me here to speak today and for organizing the event so diligently, but having done so with such passion and commitment and hard work. I think the next few days she's going to be catching up on her sleep. I'd also like to thank the City Bar for their support in getting me here today and for hosting us in this rather wonderful setting. So thank you for that too. Can I ask you in the audience, how many of you are actually from the legal community here? So how many of you are not? That's great. It's a good mix. Very good to see. All the non sat in the front row. Okay. <laughs> the focus of my talk um, is going to be on legal partnerships for the empowerment of rural women and what that means and how we go about achieving it. The corporate lawyer from the global north and the rural woman from the global south could really not be more worlds apart. One has privilege, power, influence, prestige, and are mostly men. The other bears the brunt of economic and educational disadvantage, gender discrimination, gender violence, and disproportionate familial responsibility. These groups are both the 1%, one at the top, the other at the bottom. And yet, the power of creative partnerships brings these worlds together. I'm going to attempt to demonstrate how the law is attempting to rectify the wrongs which Irene alluded to in her speech. Advocates for International Development, or A4ID as we're known, is an organization that bridges law firms with projects around the world by matching legal skills and development needs. We believe that the law can and should be used effect more effectively to eradicate global poverty. We ensure that legal support is available to those involved in the fight against poverty, and we provide those organizations with the skills and with the knowledge to use the law as an effective development tool in eradicating poverty. Our work is framed around the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, continuing our focus on the role of the law and how lawyers can play their part. As Catherine said, this year, we will be publishing a legal guide to the Sustainable Development Goals which identifies the role of the law in relation to the SDGs. A4ID is a small nonprofit, but we leverage the power of over 50,000 lawyers worldwide who donate their time and their skills to work with our development partners, who include over 700 NGOs, social enterprises, and development country governments to use the law more effectively. So far, we've undertaken over 3,000 projects which have impacted on 123 countries. We embody the meaningful commitment to Goal 617, that of partnerships, and how they can lead to real impactful outcomes in the global south. Our work demonstrates some lessons Lesson number one, partnerships between skills and needs are often separated by culture and by geography. 
intermediary organizations such as A4ID are required to engender trust, facilitate genuine partnerships, and generate and maintain relationships. Lesson number two, partnerships must be more than just a mere box ticking exercise. The lawyers that we work with demonstrate a real commitment to eradicating poverty by donating their time and their skills as well as through financial support. Lesson number three, simple matchmaking of skills and needs is insufficient. Both sides require capacity building and technical assistance. And so we train commercial lawyers on the development agenda and we equip organizations with skills to identify and remedy their legal needs. Now, I'd like to demonstrate how some of the partnerships that we have facilitated have led to demonstrative positive impact for rural women, and in doing so, have advanced the 2030 agenda. In my first example, which is from West Africa, our legal partnership boosted pre-existing legal frameworks in the process, thrusting the region into an unexpected position of being a global leader of women's right in the renewable energy sector. In my second example, our partnership exposed a massive microfinance fraud in Uganda, and a new partnership is now working towards securing remedies for its victims. My second example also highlights the context that we are more commonly faced with in the developing world, and that is namely an absence of any legal frameworks or infrastructure to protect the most vulnerable and marginalized. Indeed, time and time again, we are confronted with situations where the law can actually hamper development and can cause harm, and that, again, Irene has alluded to. So, to the first example. Affordable and clean energy is recognized as one of the core goals of the 2030 Agenda. It, like the other goals, is interrelated and intersects with all the other 16, such that none can be taken in isolation and deficits in one will impact on all the others. A lack of clean and reliable energy is an intersectional challenge for rural women. This is a particular problem for the women of the economic community of the West African states, otherwise known as ECOWAS, which comprises of 15 countries in West Africa. Now, women in these countries bear the brunt of rural transport, typically on foot. They disproportionately provide the agricultural labor and they primarily collect energy sources such as firewood and kerosene for the household. There is no doubt that there is a gender dimension to energy in West Africa. Our development partner in this case, the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, otherwise known as ACRI, is a specialized agency of ECOWAS and has a mandate to promote renewable energy and energy efficient markets within the region. Having recognized that energy poverty affects men and women differently, and that their energy needs are not always in alignment, ACRI established the ECOWAS program on gender mainstreaming in energy access. This rather visionary initiative was the first ever attempt to make gender inclusion and women's empowerment central to energy-related decisions. And this resulted in a huge step forward for women's human rights in the sustainable energy development. Ultimately, this was for, uh, formalized as a policy <clears throat> on gender mainstreaming in energy access. However, as we all know, Policies are useless without the legal machinery to enforce compliance and to inspire cultural change. 
a Cree went a step further and developed a more robust legal framework to enable gendered considerations to be specifically accessed to large-scale energy infrastructure projects. Indeed, clear, harmonized guidelines and procedures and a very strong regulatory framework was required to incorporate these con gender considerations. ACRI envisaged that the legal framework should set out ways of ensuring that the energy infrastructure operations were very gender responsive. This meant making sure that gender considerations were being actively carried out. They were monitored, evaluated, and reported on. To initiate this ambitious project, ICRI assembled a committee of expert consultants who met and began to create a similar scheme for gender impacts in the energy context. However, one crucial voice was missing from the table. And finding lawyers with commercial experience in energy projects proved a huge challenge for ICRI. So ICRI approached A4ID for urgent assistance to source a suitable team of lawyers. Within three weeks, ACRI was registered as a new A4ID development partner, and the project was scoped by A4ID in-house lawyers and was placed with a team of lawyers from the London office of the top-tier US law firm Sullivan and Cromwell. A legal team of experts from Sullivan and Cromwell developed a draft directive on gender assignments in energy projects. In June last year, ICRI hosted the first three-day workshop in Ghana, at which ECOVOX actually got together with its members and validated this directive. The workshop itself was a huge success, and the assistance provided by Sullivan and Cromwell has allowed frameworks to be put in place laying out the next steps for making the energy sector far more gender responsive. ECRI will now focus on increasing the capacity for implementation through hosting national capacity building programs and workshops to provide information and to facilitate the adoption of the directive. The provision of training on an international level for stakeholders will also be essential for the future uh, success of this project. Now, this innovative and groundbreaking legal obligation to undertake gender impact assessments on energy development projects is probably a world first. It ensures that gender sensitivity moves beyond vague statements and good intentions towards hardened, legally enforceable laws that create and require concrete actions which are visible measurable and trackable. Interestingly, it also makes West Africa a progressive world leader in the area of women's rights by being the first in the world to require gender impact assessments on any type of development project. Now, other organizations are likely to benefit from the expertise used to produce the directive with scope to expand the project outside West Africa to other regions of the world. The hope for the future is that by breaking down barriers to equal rights of participation in gender energy services, energy projects will start to bring equal benefits for both men and women and that are no longer based on gender or socioeconomic status. And indeed, more women may also be welcomed into the private and public sector energy workforce. The impact of this assessment will be to eliminate negative gender-related externalities in energy infrastructure development and reform the energy sector to make it far more responsive and better able to promote inclusiveness. Now, this project demonstrates that by putting partnerships front and center, the global community can directly access the sustainable goals of gender inequality, that's SDG 5, 
but also effectively addresses a multiple other commitments, including the eradication of poverty, SDG 1, healthy lives and well-being for all, sustainable goal three, afford affordable and clean energy, sustainable goal seven, reduced inequalities within and among countries, SDG 10, and even working towards combating climate change, which is SDG 13. Through partnerships, we can pay more than lip service to the requirement to leave no one behind. Now, A4ID was a small but necessary part of this successful partnership, providing advice and guidance on the scope of the project and developing and crystallizing the relationship between Cree and Sullivan and Cromwell and shepherding the parties to a mutual understanding of each other's needs. Once our work is done, we have to actually trust our partners to work meaningfully towards the project outcome. We know they will because we've invested in them and they have invested in us. Such is the power of true partnerships. Now my next case study demonstrates the need for a network of partners from the global north to uncover injustice and seek remedies for victims, particularly rural women. Ugandan victims of a large microfinance fraud are yet to see justice, despite their sustained efforts over the past 12, 10 years. They have been frustrated by a lack of legal frameworks and remedies. Indeed, the law has actually hampered their progress. Microfinance initiatives provide micro loans to poor entrepreneurs who would otherwise have limited access to mainstream banking services. The recipients of these are often women, both to empower economic independence for women, but more pragmatically, because evidence shows that women are actually more likely or less likely, I should say, to default on their, on their loans than their male counterparts. In the context of the developing country where regulation of the financial sector is already weak, when things go wrong, they go very wrong and can rapidly spiral out of control. Now this is particularly the case when those who were irresponsible they exploited rural women's vulnerability and financial illiteracy, knowing that in a lawless landscape, they could act with relative impunity. One such organization masqueraded as a microfinance institution. In reality, it was what is normally called a pyramid or a Ponzi scheme, where it illegally uses new investments to service old investors which inevitably becomes unsustainable. In 2006, this organization promoted itself in remote parts of Uganda, seeking to alleviate poverty to the most vulnerable groups, most of whom were women. And it did so without financial license. Initially, investors made some significant gains, leading those who initially benefited to enthusiastically encourage friends and family to also invest in the scheme. When it started becoming clear that the organization was unable to service its investors, things rapidly disintegrated. Over 3,200 individuals had invested in the scheme, involving a loss of around 4 billion Ugandan shillings, which is the equivalent of about $1.2 million. Rural women, in particular, were the hardest hit many spiraling into debt as they increase their borrowing from bona fide MFI institutions on their under, underlying debts. It was clear that impossible debts cripple women into the poverty cycle and stifle any prospect of economic advancement with, with all the knock-on effects. The position of being in debt can actually be a criminal offense punishable by incarceration in Uganda 
and the devastation that this scheme caused to rural women and communities was extreme. Women in particular suffer disproportionately, either directly or else indirectly, through the loss of their main breadwinning spouses. Increased mental illnesses, suicides, and people forced to flee the country to avoid incarceration were all a direct consequence. Initiatives were undertaken by the government to deregister the organization um, in order to freeze their accounts, and these were undone by the courts. Indeed, the courts were, uh, one of the judges actually refused to hear the case, saying that there was too much intrigue and politics involved. Stepping then into the frame was A4ID development partner, Global Alliance for Legal Aid, known as GALA an association that advocates for public interest and provides legal aid to the poor developing countries. Gala sought the assistance of A4ID to undertake a proper investigation into this Ponzi scheme. We linked Gala to the UK international law firm Simmons & Simmons, which went beyond the call of duty and flew its lawyers to Uganda to take in-depth interviews with the victims. Its findings were published in a comprehensive report that exposed in detail, for the first time ever, the gravity and scale of the fraud, and importantly, its devastating effects on the victims. Since then, A4ID is paired with another international law firm and also with local law firm in Uganda to jointly advise on the prospects, bringing a case before the Ugandan courts. In this case, however, the partnerships that A4ID has facilitated will be the best opportunity that victims have to quality justice. The impact of A4ID's partnership intervention at grassroots in this case will ensure that the most severely affected class of victims, mainly rural women, were properly represented in their fight for justice. So, from a side, the Sustainable Development Goals here of Gender Inequality, SDG 5. The project addresses <coughs> the eradication of poverty, SDG 1. Healthy lives and well-being for all, SDG 3. And most critically, promoting the rule of law and ensuring equal justice to all, SDG 16. <coughs> so these are two examples of the power of partnerships to impact the lives of the Global South, including rural women. Over the years, A4ISD has generated very many successful legal partnerships. Effective partnerships can leverage diverse skills and talents and can bring a fresh perspective to entrenched problems. Partnerships increase the powers of stakeholders to effect change by orders of magnitude for partnerships create networks that mutually reinforce all participants. However, partnerships can also be very unwieldy, or they can have intercultural barriers. Sometimes the gap between development need and skills supply is too wide for an organ organic immediate relationship. And that's where we come in, a small but critical node in the par partnership matrix. We match legal expertise, with development organizations, we foster mutual trust, and we build the understanding and capacity of all stakeholders. Through partnerships, we can bring worlds together. In our case, from the corporate tower to the rural township. It's through unlikely partnerships that sustainable development agenda will continue, and for all of us, A4ID will do all it can to promote the skills and the talents of lawyers in response to the international community so it can make that very essential difference. Thank you. So, okay. So I have the pleasure of being here this evening and we have um, really just an incredible group of women here today. We have a little problem in that we started a little late and I think we really only have 25 minutes um, for, the pro for the program. But the good news is we have a great cocktail reception where we can continue all these conversations. So we have all these Facebook
questions and Twitter questions, but I think what we'll do, because we really want to hear from our esteemed speakers, is maybe have more of a moderated conversation. So maybe you could present for five minutes. I know it's kind of a bit of a dramatic shift in the program, <laughs> but because we've started a little bit late, if we could just each present for five minutes or so, and then maybe we could take some questions from the audience, and then we will continue the conversation over cocktails, if everybody agrees. Yep. Sound good? OK. So I know it's a little bit of a change of program, but we started a little late, and we have amazing speakers. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And I'll give you each a couple minute warning. Okay, um, dist distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of myself and on behalf of Landesa, the organization I represent here, I just want to say that this is a great honor for us to be able to present uh, the work we do to promote the land rights of the rural poor, particularly focusing on women. Um, a lot has been said, and I'm not going to repeat that in the interest of time, but I'm going to focus on what frameworks we use to promote land rights of the rural poor, and I'll be basing on two countries, Rwanda, which is the country I originate from, and then Liberia. The reason why I chose those two countries is because uh, Rwanda is advanced in terms of land reform processes, and Liberia is still in its uh, early stages of land reform. Uh, to start with, uh, Landesa is an international organization working on promoting land rights, and the basic or our focus approach is to work with governments. So we work with governments to influence policy and law in, in, um, uh, in the land reform process. And the way we do it, we do it, we focus on the governments because governments adapt the law. They implement the law, and they, they bring the combination of the law politics and other issues like economics. So we thought that that was the key entry point to influencing what is being done in the country. Uh, but when we do that, we don't only influence the law as law in a book, we also take a step to ensure that laws are implemented or enforced on the ground. So th that is our approach. But while we look at the law, Landesa also understands that the law works in a system. It's not independent of the system. Uh, what do I mean by the system? The, when we talk about the system, we are talking about the people that the law is addressing. We are talking about the authorities, either the authorities that are adapting this law or the authorities that are implementing this law. We are talking about, um, we are also talking about the, the, the culture of that country that you know we have also to target. So, and we are talking about the law itself. So those four areas, land, people, rules, and authorities, are very important when you're thinking about the rule of law, because the law operates within that larger, broad system. But then we also realize that the, the, the system changes over time. And this is true to the issues related to gender, patriarchy. Patriarchy might not end, but it transforms itself as you know, things change, whether it's economic, whether it's uh, political, where there are conflicts. So within that, those changes, also the system changes, land rights changes. So Landesa looks at land rights as a continuum. It doesn't end on the laws. It doesn't end on the implementation. It continues to change. So we continue to change with change, sometimes limited by the resources that we can operate in a specific country, but that is the way we approach it. So looking at Rwanda, Landesa worked with the Rwandan government in the land reform from when it started to, to mobilize, to reform the laws, to when the law was adapted, to when the law was piloted, to then uh, capacity building in the communities. So for Rwanda, there, it was a unique situation where land was not looked at as a source of economic development, but was looked as, as a solution to many problems that the post-conflict or post-genocide country was going through. One, social harmony, uh, rule of law, 
ending discrimination. I'm not going back to the SDGs, but those who know SDGs, you can relate what I say to each SDG, but from the angle of land and the rule of law. So all those aspects for Rwanda, for Rwandan government were brought together to, uh, through land reform and the rule of law. Now, coming back to Liberia, Liberia is a different context. Well, as Liberia is in the initial stages of uh, land reform, I think it's not from the same context of addressing the same issues. So that political will that was mentioned earlier is not as strong as it was in Rwanda. Because the reality for Rwanda, it had refugees going out and refugees returning, and others going out and others returning. And in all these processes, people were leaving land behind, others were occupying land, and then we had you know, issues of uh, orphans and widows who had no land rights until 1999 when a law on succession was applied. And this brings me to another key important area when we talk about security of land rights for women. You don't look at one particular law. Laws are interrelated. When we talk about the, when we talk about the rights of women on land, we are talking about family laws. We are talking about land law. We are talking about the issues of citizenship. We are talking about the issues of child custody or land rights of the children. So it's a combination of laws that has to be addressed together to secure land rights for the rural women. It was said before, law in most cases protects the dominant groups because they are the ones that put laws in places. So for Landesa, Focusing on the rural poor and other vulnerable groups, we were trying to solve that situation where law works for the dominant groups. And particularly, we look at whatever we do, we do it with a gender lens. Landesa has put in place a, a center for women's land rights, which focuses on integrating gender into all other aspects of our work. So we know that without addressing women's land rights, the importance of women's land rights was mentioned earlier by Irene. I'm not going to go back into those. But really, the absence of women's land rights means the absence of the whole livelihood, the whole well-being of the women, their families, and their communities. It's, it's, it's a source of peace and harmony within the family. But then when you look at the continuity of land, the continuity of rights broadly, uh, for example, in Rwanda, the laws are in place, which are gender responsive. Enforcement is in place. If the woman is able to reach to the courts, the courts rules in their favor. But then it's giving rise to another issue that is related to gender power. Men are feeling powerless. They are losing the power of you know, controlling and managing property and other rights like land. So they are resorting to violence. So that is another issue that has come in place. Violence against, violence against women within the domestic atmosphere that is related to property and land gender power. So it's, it's a continuous struggle. When we talk about the rule of law and talk about justice, it's a continuous struggle. It doesn't end today. It has to continue to change with the changing circumstances. So for Landesa, that is where our approach is, to understand that it's a holistic approach, to understand that laws work in a system, and to understand that the laws must protect the most vulnerable, which is the, the weakest link of the community. So, um, so within that uh, perspective, Landesa developed uh, uh, a, a secure land rights, uh, women's secure land rights framework. And that framework highlights uh, a few areas. One, we emphasize that women's land rights must be legally and socially acceptable, well-defined, enforceable, withstanding changes, appropriately transferable, and they must be gender equal. So those areas must be addressed for land rights for the rural women to be secure and durable and to contribute best to the sustainability of development and uh, peace within a given context. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. I dare. <laughs> this is very impressive. 
I've been handed a note that says I have been given a reprieve. I actually have 10 minutes. But not wishing to stand between you and the bar, I will try and be brief. Um, my name is Christine Karen. I practice corporate commercial litigation at Norton Rose Fulbright for over 40 years. And I've been asked to speak to you about a project that came to our firm through the good auspices of Yasmin's uh, organization, which is tremendous, Advocates for International Development. And their client, for whom they were looking to find pro bono lawyers, uh, was HelpAge. HelpAge is a wonderful NGO working in rural Africa, largely amongst the elderly, but in this particular case, with a problem that affected uh, the elderly women in uh, rural communities. And that problem was the violence that arises from accusations of witchcraft, uh, which tend to raise their peak in times of high stress within the communities, where there's a bout of famine, drought, or um, some epidemic that afflicts the entire community. And in these times of high stress, there's um, usually, they're, they're associated with an increase in um, incidences of um, accusations of witchcraft, women who are actually murdered um, as a result of these accusations with no due process or mutilated or who are assaulted and banished at other times uh, from their communities to left to go off into the wilderness and um, meet their sure and fast demise, or better yet, um, whose land is sim simply confiscated in the time of a famine. Um, it's a scarce resource. Uh, uh, the younger generation wants to accelerate the, what would be the normal and inev inevitable process of death in order to get their hands on their, their inheritance much more quickly. So these problems um, uh, were the ones confronting HelpAge, and our mandate was to identify the common themes and differences in the criminal law in four different African uh, countries, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Burkina Faso, and South Africa, and more importantly for the purposes of this conference, to identify the guiding principles for a legal framework um, that would address these issues in a more adequate and viable manner. Um, I think I'll spare you um, how um, our project <coughs> relates to the sustainable development goals per se. I'll simply um, tell you that the first thing we did was study the socioeconomic and cultural factors that gave rise to this type of violence. And in doing that, and while our study predated the articulation of the 2030 SDGs, it, I'm struck when I look back at it because each one of the problems that caused the rise of the violence in the first place is related to one of the goals, which is intended to eliminate or reduce um, the problem that was the responsible or at the root of this um, violence. Violence increases in times of drought. For example, the SDGs address or seek to address proper water management. They peak at times of epidemics in a village that are often due to improper sanitation. Again, other goals. And most importantly, um, they peak at these times due to a lack of education. Education in the sense that there is no one to present these communities with logical, plausible, alternative explanations for these events. And they persist um, in large part due to all of these socioeconomic factors, um, but as well from a lack of legitimacy of the vestiges of a colonial criminal law justice system. Um, 
in many ways, these systems lack credibility with local uh, populations when it comes to implementing punishment for such crimes as violence against women under these circumstances. Why? Because these systems were imposed by a colonial government that did not share the values or beliefs of the local population in the existence of supernatural powers that could wreak havoc on these communities. And so in the end, despite our juridical training in Western um, criminal justice, the bottom line that we came to <coughs> really was that adding another crime or two in the criminal code in each one of these other countries was really not going to stem in any meaningful way the violence associated with um, witchcraft accusations. Um, what was needed um, was something more than simply handing out more or different types of um, prison sentences, which do absolutely nothing to address any of the root problems and do nothing constructive to actually repair the damage to the victim or solve the problem of the drought, the water management, sanitation within a community. And this led us to examine alternative legal frameworks, one of which has actually been put into use in Canada, the country that I come from, um, which has fully incorporated many principles of restorative justice into our criminal law. And we focused on restorative justice because contrary to a retributive justice system, where an individual, a perpetrator, is made accountable by serving a prison term, on the contrary, restorative justice is a system whereby all stakeholders take part in the exercise of judging, sentencing, and repairing the damage and tension within the community created by the particular crime in question. In other words, judges are given great discretion at each stage of the legal process to mediate um, disputes such that the perpetrator is educated, is made to repair the damage to the victim. If, for example, the and be given alternative uh, causes for the epidemic that caused a large raft of deaths within the communities. His punishment may involve digging a new well or participating in initiatives to increase sanitation, always in conjunction with the community, always in conjunction with um, the idea of education as a vehicle um, to reduce crime and recidivism. So, long and the short of the story, and I think I've just about reached my 10 minutes, <laughs> um, we um, suggested um, the a legal framework that would incorporate many of the principles of, of restorative justice employed in Canada with success, and particularly because those principles have been applied in our own indigenous communities, which have a great cultural divide um, with the uh, traditional criminal law justice system. Did I come in under 10 minutes? <laughs> so with that, I will not be the person who keeps you from the bar, but I would be happy with a drink in my hand to answer any questions you may have on that. <laughs> and thanks to everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much, New York City Bar, Catherine. Thank you so much for inviting UN Women to this very significant event. I call it a landmark event because how many times have we had events that bring the law and development together? And I think it's significant that we have the international 
law development organization here because they represent the true intersection of law and development. And as Irene said, some five years ago, it would be inconceivable to see a group of lawyers on the fringes of a United Nations event. So this is very significant, and we need to celebrate that. Secondly, we need to celebrate the rural woman. I know that we, we sympathize with a rural woman, and we know that there are challenges that she faces every day when she wakes up. But I want us to celebrate the rural woman because in many communities, they are branded witches because they are progressing. It's because society is not used to seeing a woman succeed. So in rural communities where levels of education are low, when a woman suddenly is able to buy herself a new cloth, the question is, how did you make it? You must have done this through some spiritual odd means. And that is why sometimes women in rural areas are branded witches. But you know, in their wisdom, rural women have also taught UN women a lot of things. An example relates to how Women in Ghana were able to communicate to female lawyers associations how the interstate succession law should be implemented. This law was passed in Ghana to protect widows and children from the pressure that the extended family would put on them when particularly the husband and father died. And so the idea of the law was to allocate 75% of the property to the widow and children. In rural communities, it was the women and not the men who said this wasn't a good idea and that they would prefer to have an equitable distribution system in which the property will be distributed on a one-third, one-third, and one-third basis, so that the widow will get a third, the children will get a third, and the extended family will get a third. Do you know why? They know that the extended family is very critical to their well-being. So if your daughter is going to get married, who gives her away? It's the extended family. It's the uncle of the deceased man. And so if all the property goes to the widow and the children, how dare you go and ask the uncle to come and help you to give the daughter away? So you see the wisdom that rural women can bring to development. So having celebrated ourselves and rural women, let me just announce that at UN Women, we have embarked upon a program known as Leveling the Law for Women and Girls by 2030. We hope that by the time the, uh, the SDGs uh, have to be accounted for in 2030, that every single country would have reformed its discriminatory law. And the commander in chief for this is the executive director of UN Women and her first military installation that is under attack is the 150 countries that have at least one discriminatory law according to the World Bank. We would like to attack that head on and reduce the number. Unfortunately, we have a four year strategic plan. Every four years we have a new strategic plan. So we hope to distribute uh, the 150 countries across the four-year time frames of our strategic plan. Our current strategic plan will end in 2021, and we hope that by the time that expires, that we would have reached at least 50 countries with support to eliminate discriminatory laws. What are some of these discriminatory laws? And 
Why is it important that we need to level the playing field in the area of law? Can you imagine that in the 21st century, in 32 countries, women need the permission of their husbands to apply for a passport? 17 countries have laws which stipulate that women need the permission of their husbands to travel outside of the home. Six need the permission of their husbands to travel outside of the country. In 30 countries, women cannot be heads of households. In 30 countries, women cannot choose their places of residence. In 18 countries, women need the permission of their husbands to seek employment. In 52 countries, women cannot pass on their nationality to, to their husbands. In 25, they can't do so to their, to their uh, children. I can go on and on and on. But let me end with this um, kind of intricate piece of the law, which I am still yet to understand. 125 countries have passed legislation on domestic violence, but 100 also are refusing to recognize that marital rape is a crime. It's very unbelievable. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. So we are UN women, as I said, are adopting a military approach to this. We believe we have to tackle this head on. We are the agency that has been assigned the responsibility to measure state reform of laws. So under SCG 5.1, we say that we all have to take measures to eliminate discrimination against women everywhere. There is a target 5.1.1, which deals with reforming all discriminatory laws. And we have been tasked with the responsibility of building the data methodology on that. And we have finished with this and will be administering questionnaires to all countries in order to gather data on how they are faring in many of these laws that I have, I have mentioned. Laws translate into practice. Let's not make any mistake about that. The World Bank has recognized that in countries where discriminatory laws persist, poverty also persists. So I would like to just continue from where Irene left off by just saying that in Sub-Saharan Africa, 54.9% of women are agricultural workers, but 15.5% landholders. In Latin America, they are 25% agricultural workers, 18.2% of landholders. And this goes on and on and on from region to region. Before I take my seat, I would like to mention, since we are on the premises of the bar, that UN Women is also interested in looking at court decisions because we have found that the majority male judiciary are not aware of the developments taking place. I don't think there are many judges who have even heard about the 2030 agenda. What they do is to wake up in the morning, put on the wig, the gown, and then go to court without taking <coughs> cognizant of the developments taking place. But you and I know that Justice Madison, uh, Atkinson, Lord Denning, and all the others always reminded us that when you are sitting on the bench, you must not take decisions in isolation. You need to understand the context in which your decisions are being made. Mm. So we are also working with judges. We are working with the Bar Association. Uh, around the world, we are working with women lawyers associations. I have to say that the women lawyers associations are doing a tremendous job. They are providing pro uh, bono legal services to women. Without women lawyers associations, a lot of women will not be legally empowered. 
I would like to end on the statistic that according to the Commission on the Legal Empowerment of the Poor, 14 billion people around the world lack the benefits of the law, and the majority of them are women. It is therefore a delight that we have people of different disciplines, but also lawyers who would na naturally go to court interested in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I would encourage the legal community to continue to work with the UN so that we can enforce the law and make sure that the development agenda is effectively implemented. Thank you very much. So, uh, yes. I just wanted to say that we put you in a terrible position, and I want to apologize for that because of our late start. I have a good but idea. I also want to say that we're, we're in your hands. Okay. You know the bar is waiting. Yes. I want to point out that if we, um, if we need to, some of the written questions can yeah. be answered through our executive summary. That would be so wonderful. So it's up to you if you want to make some closing remarks, you want to take a few questions. But okay. I just, I just want to empower you to please. Thank you so much. Proceed. This is the most unusual moderation of a, of a moderator. Yeah. So, <laughs> But I just wanted to just follow up on a couple of things that were said. Um, one was in terms of the World Bank report on, on discriminatory laws. We've also studied that um, report very well. And uh, we should probably mention there are two countries in the world that have a discriminatory law against paid maternity leave. One would be the U.S. with no paid maternity leave, and the other would be Papua New Guinea. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, then uh, secondly, I wanted to say that I completely agree with the idea of trying to um, bring judges in particular into the fold. And, and we did start a center at Cornell about nine years ago for women judges uh, working around the world with actually your former Chief Justice Wood who the Chief Justice of Ghana, one of nine women Chief Justices in the world. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the women judges around the world, of which there are frankly many, although not many Chief Justices, um, have really played an important role in helping to educate their male colleagues on the bench. We focused on ending violence against women in particular, but what we did find was judges, working with women judges, working with women's lawyers associations, and so I very much encourage everyone to support UN's women's goal. Um, before I uh, end, I wanted to just ask one more question. Uh, to Dr. Uvetsa, because I felt like Lindessa really, uh, when I started my work with the Cornell Center, Lindessa for me was a really important um, organization. And I wondered, since you've been studying and, and working in this field for so long, as we know, land rights is at the core at the end of the day of um, any kind of economic empowerment for rural women. What are you seeing as best practices, and are you trying to sort of travel those best practices around the world? Is there a couple of just parting thoughts you could give, because we feel that we would love to hear more from you, actually, and we wish we had more time. So if I could just end with that, and then maybe we could take questions in, in the executive summary. OK. Uh, thank you for that question. I think for us, the best practices and what we have seen working, I kind of touched on it, is applying law to the whole system and working with the government. Because we have realized that in the global south, a government is a key player in putting in place laws, but also in implementing those laws. So working with them to make them understand land rights, to make them understand diversity of the people they lead, I think for us has been the very important way to go. And I talked about Rwanda and Liberia. Rwanda is a country that had a political will for its history. Liberia has a political will, but another kind of political will that has to be pushed by citizens. So while in, Iran, while in Liberia we are also working with the government, but we are also strongly working with the civil society organizations and other partners, like putting in place, uh, for example, and supporting uh, civil society organizations for land rights, but also putting in place uh, women's land rights that's force that brings together different partners. So in Liberia we are taking a more collaboratory approach than we did in Rwanda, where in Rwanda we focused on working with the government through. And in both, uh, both pro uh, countries, we work through USAID project. So I think it's contextual in most of the cases, although we have our frameworks like that one I talked about, which is about security of land rights for women. We try to also understand the context and see what are the entry points that we can use to influence what is happening. So some, yeah, I think that's what I would say. So look at the context you're working with, understand the system, understand the government, understand the challenges, and find entry points. Thank you. 
Well, there was one other point that I wanted to make that related to something that Dr. Khan had said earlier, which was that with respect to sort of um, the economic empowerment of women and getting women access to land and getting access women to food security, there's some incredible statistic that if women just had equal access to the tools that they needed to farm, you could fill, feed a billion more people in the world. So with that, I just, I had to make that point because it's just an unbelievable point. So I really do feel awkward asking uh, this panel to end. Actually, Catherine, what I think you should do, and I would be happy to support you, is do a whole day. <laughs> and I think this is, requires an entire day. This is an amazing conference that you've put together. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's patience with time. I know people have commitments. We hope that you cancel your commitments and stay, and we can all talk um, over, over drinks. I mean, why not? Okay, <laughs> so thank you. I, I turn it to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Catherine, for, for organizing such a wonderful event.